an integrated solution, if you will. It, one unit will do all of that, um, you know, so it gives you better access to, um, you know, not only push to talk radio, which is a traditional, uh, you know, two-way communication on a, on a radio, but it gives you camera, uh, high-speed video camera access, uh, high-speed data applications, and uh, they, at this point right now, have the ability to run uh, Android apps like a cell phone. Welcome to the Wireless Communications Explained podcast, where IT, engineering, and operations professionals learn about wireless communications. This includes how to develop true dispatch communications, implement and manage communication tools, improve one-to-many communication, keep up to date with security and customer satisfaction trends, increase coverage and range, and roll out push-to-talk technology. Welcome to Wireless Communications Explained. In this podcast episode, I'm being joined by Mike Humphreys, who's president of Consult Consulting Solutions, and Bob White, a systems engineer at EMCI Wireless. Mike and Bob, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Joshua. Hey, Josh. Hey, Mike. Hey, Bob. Um, so the first place to get started with is to give, Bob, could you give our audience, could you give our viewers, our listeners, a little bit of context on your background and how you ended up in your current role at EMCI Wireless. Sure, Josh. Yeah, I've um, been around the communications since 1978 uh, in the uh, United States Air Force, uh, six years in the Air Force uh, in digital communications, um, and then uh, joined uh, Motorola in 1984. And uh, at Motorola for uh, on and off, I believe uh, it's about 20, 26 years. Um, and then I was a consultant uh, for 10 years. And then I joined EMCI Wireless uh, January of 2021. Wow. So you've been able, to, you've had um, experience both in military and, and corporate and all, all different facets, all different size environments. I'm sure that comes in. Very handy in understanding the topic at hand that we're going to be talking about today, which is all everything you wanted to know about digital radios compared to analog radios and the big differences between the two technologies. And with that in mind, what, let's just kick it off and get into the basics of this. What is the big difference between digital radios and analog radios? Yeah, the, the, the biggest difference uh, right now is, and I kind of put it in simple terms, is analog is old digital is is new um, everything is moving towards digital the analog uh, radios um, are I guess the radios uh, your, your grandfather's radios if you will from the 1920s um, they um, and they've been replaced with the digital radios um, digital technology um, I guess without getting down into the um, really down into the the nuts and bolts a, a digital radio um, transmits uh, using ones and zeros, if you will, and a analog radio looks more like a voice or a sine wave. Um, that's how it communicates over the air. Um, but uh, digital radios have uh, evolved over the last 10 to 12 years to incorporate um, uh, higher speed data, uh, push to talk, voice communications, along with data applications that are, um, can be used because the radio is digital. So at a high level, someone coming from a generalist IT background that instinctively is thinking digital is ones and zeros and radio looks like a sine wave is pretty spot on with their intuition. Yeah, I think somebody from with an IT background, uh, digital, I mean, digital has been around for a long time. Even when you, uh, you know, radio technology, telephone technology, um, all uh, it's all analog, um, and then is converted to digital. It's been converted to digital for for years um, to transmit it across the, the telephone lines and across the air. But um, the main difference is is that the digital radio, not only the way the radio is transmitted, but it's also um, the way the, um, the radio handles the communications and the features that run in the radio as well as across the air. Um, there's a lot of noise cancellation. Uh, the audio is much, much crisper and clearer. Um, it uh, allows you to have, um, to also to, to run the applications on there 
that would allow for um, push to talk and text messaging, GPS location, and all the things that uh, it does now in the current versions of digital radios. When I think of another IT parallel, one thing that comes to mind is, remember dial-up modems and the technology there. And after a while, there, there came a point in time, probably around 2005, maybe the early 2000s, where you just, it would be they really, really big in the late 90s and early 2000s. They had the AOL movie, the you got milk movie, and everyone knew kind of the screeching sound, and then all of a sudden it went away. Is it kind of that shift? Have we gotten to the point where it seems like at some point the analog radios are just going to disappear and become obsolete, or are there still some special mission critical applications that you're just not going to be able to replace with what you can get with analog radios anytime soon? I think it's, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I, I believe it's, uh, and you start talking about modems and AOL and, and those types of things brings back memories. Um, that was my main, uh, my main uh, uh, job was working for Motorola with the uh, data communications and it was mainly dial up modems uh, for credit card uh, verification transactions uh, large multiplexers um, where we would take, uh, you know, uh, high speed applications that our, our uh, customers and transmit them across phone lines. Um, but um, yeah, it's, it's going to be very similar to that. I mean, now, no, I mean, I, I, you don't hear dial up modems very often. They do still exist, um, but it'll be very similar to, you know, everybody has, you know, Wi-Fi, wireless, um, LTE, um, those types of uh, applications, you know, they'll, 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 uh, they, you know, they'll, they'll replace the analog, uh, analog modem eventually. There's a lot of stuff that's deployed already that's still out there. Um, I think the industry estimates it's about 60% of the communication is, is digital and 40 still exists as analog. Um, it's going to take a while to uh, get that all converted to digital, but it still exists out there. You know, I think the other thing, though, that you got to keep in mind is that when people buy these systems, a lot of the times, you know, they're buying, you know, just the beneficial use of the product and they really don't care or know. They don't have that answer to that question. So what? You know, why would I bother making that shift, even though technologically we know what's happened in the background? Uh, you got a lot of people out there that have been using analog radios for years and years and years. In fact, they've become so used to the way analog radios sound, the way they function, Bob and I were talking earlier about the fact that, you know, w when you sold a radio system years ago, your customers actually got used to the fade area, the area where the signal degraded a little bit more and a little bit more the further you got away from the transmitter. And they knew how to kind of negotiate and navigate that, uh, that fade area, even though the audio quality wasn't very good. And digital is different uh, in the way that it's handled. And it, it's a little bit unsettling at first, uh, when you when you make that shift, and a lot of people are are still used to and still happy with their analog radios. I mean, would you not think that's uh, that's kind of the case, Bob? Yeah, I think that is, Mike. I think the the shift to digital um, is uh, the, the voice sounds different, but as you talk on the radio, you can you, you can recognize the person on the other end with the digital radio. Some people will complain that. You can't recognize them. It's more digitized. It's more mechanical sounding, but you can recognize them on the other end. Um, that's the thing is, you know, you, you, you give up maybe a little bit um, there, you know, knowing, knowing when you're, you're going to have that fade, but your digital radio traditionally does transmit farther um, through buildings better. You do get better coverage with the digital radio system, even though, when you get on the fringes, you're going to, you know, the voice will digitize for a little bit and then it just flat out goes away. Um, kind of like the pixel, pixelization on your, on your, uh, your TV. Um, when you're, you're, you're you get uh, rain fade on your, on your satellite dish it, it'll, it'll start to go. And then eventually it just goes all, all together. Um, but that's, that's kind of, um, you know, kind of maybe, a, I don't know, a, a difference. You know, digital, you, you, you've got communications and it's good, it's clear, it's crisp, uh, but you don't have that, uh, you know, that analog fade, if you will. Mm -hmm. That 40% number fascinates me because it seems relatively high for a technology that probably has been trying to sunset quite some time. If I think about 
like in the smartphone world, if Apple or Google wants to twist the arm of people to retire old hardware, all they have to do is make it so the next version of Android or iOS makes it really difficult to use on that hardware. Ditto for Apple on the desktop or, or Microsoft in the Wintel world. Um, so yeah, there's got to be some compelling applications that are keeping there and probably not a lot of pressure to it, either in the industry or from Motorola's side for the technology to go, analog technology to go away anytime soon. Well, the, the, our industry is not without arm twisting, right? <laughs> uh, narrow banding probably is the greatest example of arm twisting that is out there. Wouldn't you think, Bob, that when, uh, when you had to make the shift into a narrow banded radio, you could do that with analog. Uh, but a lot of radios had to be converted into something that would be uh, more applicable to FCC standards and would work within their, their parameters. And at that particular point in time, a lot of people went ahead and made the shift to digital. But um, there were narrow banded radios out there and still are in analog that, that work. But uh, I think we had a little arm twisting. Um, and I think the other arm twisting comes in feature sets and capabilities. Uh, you know, I don't know what your take on that is, Bob, but at least that's kind of the from my point of view, that uh, that's kind of what we've done industry-wide. Yeah, I think w what you'll see is they're, they're, they've had several deadlines, <laughs> you know, for conversion. I mean, they, they had, uh, you know, huge, huge uh, public safety rebanding efforts. Those deadlines got changed several times. They've got, they've, um, they had to uh, make the shift to, uh, was HDTV. That took a while. Um, they had to, had to change right. the deadlines on those because you couldn't just shut everybody's TV off. Yeah. you know, across the country. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't live in big cities like us that uh, rely on some of that analog, old analog stuff that's out there. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think that it's, it's there, that's the thing is there will always be, I mean, there's, you know, ham, ham radio operators. Um, there are other people that, you know, they, they, they it's just not something that they're going to, uh, you know, if it's still working for them, they they don't see a compelling reason to, to go spend money and, and change to a digital radio. Um, I think uh, you'd be surprised, you'd be amazed at how many um, re what we call repeaters um, that sit on mountaintops, sit on top of buildings, sit in little shacks that um, that still communicate in an analog mode um, that are out there that have not you know been identified and not been replaced. Or it can't be replaced because the customers in that area are still using analog radios. But um, yeah, that's it's probably a pretty high you know it's a pretty high number. But you know it's not like um, you can just uh, shut them off um, and shut off all your customers, especially when you're the federal government that's doing it. Yeah, that got me thinking too of like what's the FCC's position on all of this? Do they generally go with the consensus, or do they have a strong feeling one way or the other of supporting? digital as opposed to analog radios or is it varied by administration? Yeah, I, I really, I really don't know um, the answer to that, Josh. Actually, it's all about efficient use of the spectrum. That's, that's their, their primary number one, it's a revenue source now. Right. Um, and uh, they auction off frequencies. They make millions and millions and millions of dollars. Um, and there's always a constant fight going on. You know, the spectrum is a natural resource and it's a finite natural resource. And it's only through technology that you can continue to squeeze more capacity out of that finite resource. Um, so the commission is always interested in finding more efficient uses for the spectrum, better ways to, uh, to deliver uh, that particular natural resource to the users out there. And everything is wireless now. So there is even more and more clamoring for, uh, for this, this highway, if you will, that all this stuff has to travel on. Uh, so I think that that is, without a doubt, that's their primary directive, um, maybe, maybe secondary to making money, but I think their primary directive really is the, is the efficient use of that particular resource. So you mentioned when it comes to digital radios, it's a lot of times the applications that are driving usage. Do you see that as the biggest advantage that digital radios have over analog today? Is that the biggest problem that digital radios are solving is that they're introducing all these new applications? I think so. I think so. I, I think, in, and again, Bob and I had this conversation and Bob, I'll let you chime in on the, on the difference from the, from the capacity and the bandwidth standpoint, you know, it, it, it changed the game for uh, the actual end users of the product so that they now have the ability to do a lot of different things that they couldn't do before. 
uh, and I'll let I'll let Bob get a little more technical on that. But right, yeah, just uh, a couple examples. Uh, you know, uh, we're, we're kind of Motorola centric um, at EMCI, uh, being a Motorola partner. But uh, there are some very high end radios, public safety radios, uh, commercial radios, that have the ability to uh, work um, not only on the radio system. They work on Wi-Fi. They work on um, LTE. Um, and they have the ability to um, do the, the, the integrated solution, if you will. It, one unit will do all of that. Um, you know, so it gives you better access to, um, you know, not only push to talk radio, which is a traditional, uh, you know, two-way communication on a, on a radio, but it gives you camera, uh, high-speed video camera access, uh, high-speed data applications. And uh, they, at this point right now, have the ability to run uh, Android apps like a cell phone, uh, like a smartphone, not just a cell phone, but a smartphone. Um, so all that stuff is, is opened up with the higher speed. That's always been the drawback on, on traditional LMR, land mobile radio systems, is that the, the, the data applications had to be, um, had to be small. They, they could, didn't have a lot of bandwidth, but now with the, with the Motorola radios, they've created um, the ability to connect them to LTE, uh, a, a public LTE or a private LTE, um, and uh, use that for their uh, communication. So from the standpoint, there's a lot of different kinds of roles, a lot of different kind of verticals and applications for wireless radios. What's the primary driver for a security concerned IT manager, maybe that's in a, a regulated space, um, from the standpoint of someone that's especially con security concerned, um, what are the, what's the big advantage that digital is going to provide over analog or is there? I would say probably the, the only one I could really come up with on that, Josh, is that, um, you know, you, encrypted communications is becoming more and more um, uh, prevalent. Um, they are encrypting the voice so that um, it can't be, um, you know, captured over the air um, or on the Internet or, you know, if it's, it's, if it's IP based, you know, it's going to go across the Internet somewhere, but they can encrypt the digital signal much easier uh, without the delay, and there used to be a lot of delay when you encrypt, and it would also affect the quality of the voice. But the encryption schemes nowadays um, are much better with the digital radios than they ever were with the analog radios. That's the main difference that I can see uh, security-wise. But you know, an IT manager is, you know, not only worried about the radio system, but he's worried about that the data that's coming from the radio system into his system, um, his his IT corporate backbone, if you will. Um, so, you know, once it's encrypted, it's encrypted at the end, it's encrypted at the radio on either end, the device on either end is encrypted. So it, it, once it's in the IT system, it's, you, you know, you, you can't decrypt it. So until you get it out the other end on the, on the, you know, the other device, that's the only thing I can really think of would be, uh, maybe an IT manager. And what we, what we see a lot of times is, uh, with, as the radio systems have evolved is the IT manager a lot of times is the person that inherits the uh, radio system because it, it has an IP address. And um, so, you know, the, the, the traditional radio shops um, are not what they used to be since now they're digital. They're, they have an IP address. They'll, they'll um, be taken over by the IT department. And that is a that's a fact as far as the who the point of contact is with customers and everything else is now the IT director, the IT manager, the CIO, CTO. Um, they're they're intimately involved in all things that were traditionally maybe operations, maybe they were facilities maintenance, they were security, that were your points of contact. And now because of all of this integrated technology, that all interfaces with IT. Um, that is now the individual that is the driving force behind the decisions and understanding what, what happens. And I think that because of the digital migration, the change to digital, uh, that's one of the shifts that took place overall. So, Yeah, I'm thinking like the person who's losing sleep over is the VPN investment that we have good enough. Is the public key cryptography really keeping up with the bad guys? is the SSL, all, all these things that they're constantly worried about with having 
uh, being having their checks and balances in place with cybersecurity. So yeah, it's, it sounds like similar concerns as you move to IP-based radios. Sure. Next area I want to talk briefly about is how digital and analog radios compare for someone uh, following a natural disaster. We're actually recording this at the early end of Atlantic hurricane season. Um, so a natural thing that someone would be wondering is, is there any advantage to staying with analog as opposed to migrating to digital or vice versa uh, for different kinds of applications that would use wireless when there's um, large areas that are losing power, losing telecommunications lines? Yeah, Josh, what, what I would say is um, that since the digital uh, technology is newer, it's more reliable, it's a more reliable choice. It has a better chance of uh, working during the disaster and fo or, or following the disaster. Um, a lot of uh, the radio operators or system operators, they will, um, what we call in the industry, we call they harden, they harden their sites, which basically means that they have a backup generator that's gonna keep that thing on the air. Um, you know, for a number of hours or even numbers of days. Um, and a lot of those sites have, um, you know, if they have the um, antennas that are, uh, that are, uh, you know, uh, wind speed rated, um, the towers are, you know, uh, more solid, especially here in Florida, um, you know, they're, they're, uh, they're structurally sound, more structurally sound than, than some other um, operations might use. You might have someone that has an old analog repeater out in the, out in the middle of a cornfield or something that's up on the top of the water tower. Um, that may not be as hardened. Uh, that's going to go away when it loses power. Um, but mainly, um, the digital, the digital would be the choice. Um, I would use, um, prefer, um, you know, during a disaster. Um, I remember being here in Florida during the three hurricanes back to back to back and the, um, Everything, everything went down, but the, um, the uh, digital uh, radio system that I was working on, um, that, was, that's, that stayed on the air the entire time and it did not, uh, did not suffer any, any outage. Um, but you know, we, we still do, um, at the public safety sites, we still do provide some, um, most, mostly the digital repeaters, but sometimes there will be an analog repeater. And like I mentioned earlier, we still put a lot of those analog uh, talk groups, I'm sorry, channels, not talk groups, channels, radio channels into the radio so you can communicate. If for some reason you lose the digital system, you might might be able to get out on the analog, but the digital would be, um, we're gonna pay most attention to keep the, keep the digital channels on the air. For uh, installation that's really concerned with continuity and resiliency following a natural disaster. I know coming from the like mission critical data center world, it's common practice that they'll use a battery backup as a supplement for that short period of time between when there's an outage and when the generator is fired up. Is there that same kind of concern when you're putting together wireless systems? Is there usually batteries that are providing kind of that, that instant before the generator takes over? Yeah, that, that generally is how they, they uh, provide the backup power is you, 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 you run on the, your commercial power, you're backed up by batteries um, first, and then in the interim, you know, the batteries keep the system up on the air and then the generator will kick in. Um, then most, most counties or public safety, um, even commercial, will have contracts with the, um, the local propane or a diesel fuel provider you know, they've got contracts, you know, to keep those sites on the air. So they've got priority on fuel delivery and stuff like that. So. One of the other questions that I have is I know EMCI wireless does a lot of work with law enforcement. And one of the situations that sadly has become way too common in the last several years are active shooter situations and that kind of crisis would someone from law enforcement generally prefer in a situation like that to be working on analog radios or digital radios? I think the um, answer to that is that um, they would want to have the, the clearest, most reliable uh, communications between the commanding officer and the, uh, the sniper or the person that might be um, 
might be, uh, you know, ready to take the shot, you know, to take out the, um, the perpetrator. Um, there's a big, ex- there's a big difference between, you know, the conversation or the, or the, or what you hear between shoot and don't shoot. Um, you know, that, that, you know, if, if, if a syllable gets cut off or a word gets cut off, the, it means something completely different. It means a matter of life and death to somebody. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's going to be, um, much, much clearer, much crisper, um, on a digital system. Uh, you wouldn't have the interference. You won't have somebody cutting in. There's no crosstalk. Wouldn't be the crosstalk issue where somebody else would, would jump in and, and, you know, confuse the conversation and they're not going to they're not going to pick up conversations on a scanner they're not going to be able to listen in necessarily you've got more security but i think the other thing is going back to some of the things that come along with digital with the the integration of all these different technologies is when a when an officer can actually go live feed into a video that's in a school as an example and watch what's going on just from his mobile device or his you know his, his mobile radio or whatever the case may be um that's all been a benefit of, of digital. And that's another life-saving scenario right there that, uh, that points directly to the fact that, you know, the integration and, and the collaboration between the private system that may be in the school and the public safety system and the ability for those two things to, uh, to coordinate uh, is, is a pretty critical function. Yeah, I mean, it brings to mind the tragedy that happened in Parkland um, in 2018. And there was a lot of talk in the days uh, weeks, months following that um, the law enforcement had a lot of difficulty communicating using radios, that there was delays on the video feed that people had assumed weren't there. And it seemed like in the year following that, um, I live about 45 minutes north in Palm Beach County, that there was a big interest in the schools and hardening perimeters. They put a lot of, of resources into that. And then sure enough, within a year later, the pandemic comes along. Do you see the general environment now where you see school districts wanting to upgrade that or the sheriff's departments that support the school districts wanting to, uh, to support that? Or is it the, the kind of thing that they were super interested in talking about it in the months and weeks following it? And now the, the technology has been moved more to the back burner because of more pressing issues. No, no, it is fully on the front burner and fully uh, it, between public safety and the education market. Those are probably the two most robust markets today. Um, and for those very reasons, for the unfortunate reason that, you know, you have to do more to provide safety to the students and staff in the schools. And uh, of course it carries over to hospitals, you know, healthcare and, and other things as well. But, you know, the, the, the light is still shining very brightly on that need. And there are, there are millions and millions of dollars being spent regularly on upgrading systems, whether it's the coverage of the, inside the school itself, which Bob is very active in, in I know in, in helping with uh, with BDA DAS systems, which are basically systems that that allow for public safety to have full coverage in every corner of a building, um, and up to and including the video component, access control, all of those things are 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 wildly important and wildly popular today, more so even than after Parkland, because it's grown even greater since then. I mean, you can go back to what happened in Connecticut eight or 10 years before that and what happened in Colorado decades before that. I grew up in the 80s, and in addition to fire drills, we had uh, uh, air raid where we got under the deaths in theory because if there was a, a bomb strike that that was going to protect it's us. protect you. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My, my kids are growing up in this era where they're very all too familiar with the code red drills. So, yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely part of Sad another, true. another ad- adaptation with all that. Um, so shifting gears from the active shooter law enforcement applications over to hospitals, healthcare, that's another area that's faced incredible amounts of pressure to do more with less over the last year or two during the pandemic. Um, what, how do hospitals generally make these decisions on deciding whether to use digital as opposed to analog radios? Yeah, the, the, what, what we found so far, a lot of the hospitals, like you had said, they're, they're, they're behind, they're kind of behind the curve. Um, a lot of hospitals still use pagers. Well, I mean, they, they, you know, they page the doctors, they page the orderly, they, they use pager systems. So, um, what we, um, you know, I guess, you know, what, what I see there is they, they need to move into the digital era, if you will. I mean, they have a lot of, um, you know, their tablets, they've got their pagers, they've got their cell phones, 
they've got all those, but nothing is really integrated. They need an integrated uh, communication system that you know works on not only the radio system, but works on the Wi-Fi, works on the, the LTE or the private LTE in that hospital. That's always kind of a thing with hospitals is they usually, you know, they need to talk within that big concrete building. Um, so that's where, you know, a lot of DAS, BDA type things. Um, those, those types of devices are more um, user friendly, I guess. They, they work better um, with the digital radios. They will, they will work with analog radios. They will repeat the signals um, analog, but um, for the integration of all of the systems, um, they, they, they need to move to digital. And I think that uh, we, we are seeing some of that. We don't see that much. Um, you know, they do need, um, you know, uh, they need uh, at times, you know, instant access, you know, push to talk on a radio. They need to talk to somebody right now. Um, and they do suffer, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, they got big concrete buildings and, you know, they don't talk very well inside of their radios. Don't talk necessarily that great inside of there. With a digital radio, you got a better chance of talking in that building than you do with an analog radio. But um, that, um, you know, it, it, it's, you know, they, they need, they need, they need to, they need communications in that hospital. I guess that's all I'm say there. But I know I'm working with a lot of managed service providers over the years that do Wi-Fi installations. I know they've had a lot of complications and challenges with just installing access points for the regular 802 kind of technologies and imagine it's the same kind of thing. Are hospitals incredibly unique because they're using so much concrete? Are there other environments uh, where the, that poses challenges or the hospital's truly unique like that? It, it's always challenging in a building that is, um, that's being retrofitted for a DAS BDA system, Wi-Fi, LTE, whatever, whatever goes into that building. Um, you know, and those are your older buildings. Uh, I believe, you know, now there are uh, you know building regulations that if a building is of a certain square footage or a certain size that has to be built in at the time that the building is is uh, constructed but that's that's the challenge is once a you know an older hospital you know um, needs to do this or to retrofit it it's a lot of work it's a, it's a lot of expense pulling the cables through those um down those hallways and through the hospitals a lot of regulations um you can't just go prop a ladder up in the middle of the floor and pull a cable through the ceiling um, you know, there's, there's just a lot of regulations you got to meet um, in the hospitals, a lot of rules. So is, is that gradually how these upgrades are happening as you see a hospital that doubles in capacity and builds a brand new building and they're out of the gate putting digital in there? Or is there just so much interest in preserving their existing investment in analog that they're still even slow to change with new construction? I would say they're probably they're, they're slow slow to change because of the expense. Um, most of their expense probably most of their money is probably being spent in the newer, um, you know, the new wing of the hospital or the new hospital that's going up. Um, the retro, like I said, the retrofitting of it is a lot of a lot of expense to uh, pull that cable through the building and install access points and that. That's that's usually that is the, that is most of the cost of installing a, a, a DAS PDA system is the installation of the cable and access points. Uh, one more industry application to talk about. Um, we spent a lot of, we spent a lot of time in this podcast talking about hotels, hospitality, entertainment in the hospitality and entertainment space right now. What's the default that most people are choosing are still most people preferring analog or has there been a move to, Digital. That's an interesting vertical because it's you know it, it's it's so widely varied in terms of size and scope. Um, you know you may have a, you know smaller hotels and properties that analog radios are doing just fine. Uh, they're budget restricted, so you know a lot of analog radios uh, are, are much less expensive to buy and get into. Uh, I think it's one of the harder vertical markets um, to convince for the need for digital, if they are using an analog system that's still working for them. Uh, and, and from a, from a sales perspective, the, I think the greatest play has to do with the enhancements that come along with that in terms of the single, single device, um, uh, being able to use apps that are very prevalent in the hospitality industry um, and being able to, to use those on the same device that you have a push to talk radio on, uh, uh, operating on. Um, 
you know, it, it, the rest of the the rest of the issues that are the differentiators between the two, other than maybe the extended battery life that you get with digital. Um, so you get a little longer talk time than you would in analog uh, without having to recharge. Some of those things are nice to haves. I don't know if they're critical to haves um, in that particular industry. So I think the the main play from my perspective is is what digital brings in terms of additional feature sets and capabilities. The line of business applications, basically. Yeah. 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 Final question, where are we headed next? What does the future look like in this debate between digital and analog radios thinking out over the next two or three years? Well, from what I've read and I studied, um, analog is going to be around for the next 10 years. Um, they've extended, the FCC has extended it out at least another 10 years out to 2030 and nine to 10 years. Um, and, uh, you know, there's always going to be the low cost user, the low cost option, you know, for so you know, some, some radios that are blister packed and you buy them at Sam's or Costco, you know, and, and use those for your, they, they call those a family radio system. You may use them you know, at the theme park, you may use them for hunting, things like that. There's always going to be an analog. Um, you know, there's also a you know, low cost analog and there's going to be you know, possibly a low, low cost digital as well. Um, but, you know, the, the, they'll always have analog will always be there. Um, it's not going to be very sophisticated. There's not going to be, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, you know, radio repeaters on tops of buildings that you'll be able to use. <clears throat> It'll mainly be a walkie talkie point to point type thing. Um, but analog will go away at some point in time. Um, you, you'll have your radio enthusiasts. You'll have your people that you know, don't want to give up their walkie-talkies. But um, analog, as far as analog infrastructure, and that will um, you know, be converted to digital. I mean, you know, let's, let's be honest. You know, there are still a lot of people out there that lament the fact that their flip phone is no longer viable, you know, uh, <laughs> That you know they, they don't have their star tack anymore because it was the best best cell phone I ever had. Uh, there will be people like that with analog radios, I'm sure. Has any of this gotten caught up in the current conversations around just modernizing infrastructure as a whole and trying to get broadband out to rural areas, and um, or a lot of these discussions really not intertwined in that at all? I don't see them as being intertwined all that much. How about you, Bob? I, I don't either. Not not at this point. I think most of the, the infrastructure they're talking about is, you know, getting Wi-Fi to the rural communities. Um, you know, I don't see this really being, you know, uh, part of a, of a radio system. I can't see them installing, you know, infrastructure for radio systems as part of the infrastructure right. working on. Yeah, it seems a flashpoint for a lot of that was getting uh, broadband access for distance learning for right. kids being out of school during the pandemic. So yeah, it's super interesting. So it sounds like we have a, the better part of the decade. Uh, analog will at least have some continued life and will still continue to be fully supported in the wireless communications industry side by side with digital applications. Make for interesting times. This has been super helpful. Um, we've been hearing today from Mike Comfres from Consult Consulting Solutions and Bob White from EMCI Wireless. Any other closing thoughts on the topic of comparing analog and digital radios? Not really, other than the fact that, uh, you know, it, communications being as critical as it is, you know, just choose one or the other. Uh, you know, you, you, uh, uh, there are still a very viable way to, to run a business and run an operation, and they're still critically needed for a lot of different applications. So uh, while digital may be the choice that is the better choice to buy new stuff, uh, uh, there's still a place for both out there right now. That's terrific. Thanks so much for sharing today. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Bob. And wish you all great success in continuing with your wireless installations. Thanks, Joshua. Appreciate Thanks. it. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wireless Communications Explained podcast. To get notified about new episodes, subscribe at wirelesscommunicationsexplained.com or wherever you like to consume podcast episodes, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. And if you found this episode helpful, please leave us a five-star rating and tell your friends. Music